by the end of this exercise, get to know ways, ways writing terms can be organized. I will also understand how to avoid uh, predatory journals, how to share research results with the general public. So basically, that is the objective of this particular session today. And I would like to call on um, Jane Davis, who is to give us a presentation on the overview on writing. I'll give Jane 15 minutes to make uh, a presentation to us. Jane, you have the floor. Thank you. Okay. Hello, everyone. Welcome. Um, I'm going to present, be presenting on um, writing, giving an overview of writing and disseminating your work. Um, so for those of you who have written or are working on a paper now, um, we're, we're going to discuss some of the key points around why it's important to do this and how you come to choose a journal and, and um, get your work out there to the public. I um, Just a little background on myself. The, um, I was a managing editor for the Canadian Journal of Occupational Therapy for eight years. And so a lot of my experiences um, that I'm going to talk about come from um, that point of view. So the objectives um, for the next 15 minutes or so um, are to understand why it's important to write up your work, understand about different academic paper formats. Um, we're going to initiate the use of a common language. So looking at developing a glossary and a terminology to help with communicating about publishing your work. We're um, hopefully people will learn how to uh, choose a journal for publishing your work and be able to find and use journal author guidelines. So with respects to writing up your work and why it's important. The, the, um, so there's different types of work and all different types of work are of value and different journals will accept different types of work. The, it's really important to not only write them for yourself or to do research or discussion around certain areas, but also to bring that work forward so that others can um, read and critique and build upon your work. So it also brings researchers together to communicate with each other and it helps build research communities like Pearl, for instance. And when different people are doing different research um, without any connections, the research becomes a little bit more disjointed. And when, when those people come together, then some common threads can build the research and maximize the potential. So it supports expanding areas of study. Also, it's really important to think about um, the ethical and moral considerations so if you have engaged others in, in your research work or collecting information or in generating ideas, it's really important with respect to honoring people's commitment and making sure that's not wasted. When you go about writing your work, you're going to, and submitting it to someone, disseminating it, you're going to look at submitting it, academic work to an academic publication. And there's certain uh, things that the that an academic publication requires of you that will help you actually become a stronger writer and become uh, be able to disseminate your your um, work in a very uh, rigorous and clarified way. So some things that submitting your work to an ac academic publication can do is that it helps you really understand ethical processes that are involved in working with other individuals and also um, establishing rigorous research procedures. It requires you to use a standardized presentation format, um, like following author guidelines, for instance. And they journals use a standardized presentation format so that readers can come to understand how information is being um, disseminated and be able to follow a roadmap of sorts um, to understand what the person is actually saying. It offers you the ability to present important new knowledge. So, you know, the only way that the world sort of evolves and ideas evolve if, is if we disseminate information and, and we want to disseminate new and important knowledge and not just disseminating the same knowledge over and over again. So we want to build on previous knowledge. But, uh, submitting to an academic uh, publication will initiate a blinded or an unblinded. So whether you might know the peer reviewer or you might not know the peer reviewer, um, the, the review process is really important for you. 
It's one where you'll get feedback from colleagues who will challenge you on certain ideas and support your own thinking, your own development. And in my experience working on the Canadian Journal of Occupational Therapy, I've seen um, articles uh, uh, that have been submitted that have gone through extreme changes and have evolved into really substantive pieces of uh, publication. It also provides you with just general feedback to help clarify, clarify your ideas and um, your analyses. So the type of analyses you're doing. And through that, through those comments, you get engage other literature that they might refer you to, other ideas and other ways of understanding knowledge. So all of these things are why it's really important to write up your work. So not only to support the building of knowledge and the person's uh, and your you, anybody you engage in the research, their commitment to your research, but also to help you expand your own ideas and your own work. Uh, there's different academic paper formats. Um, I'm just gonna just list them briefly here. Opinion pieces, which really are about presenting your own ideas, your own opinions, typical, typically a critical perspective on a, a certain idea. We've all, we often see these in media, but they can also be published in some journals. A theory papers, so they present a theoretical idea that's been developed. Um, often, even though they're theory papers and considered non-research, they often it's important to have some sort of um, data within that theoretical paper to support some of the the assumptions that you're making. Practice papers describe things like the use of technology and practice, the use of um, the internet, um, how people access to different community opportunities, those types of things are focused on practice papers. Research is disseminating um, re, uh, work that has collected quantitative, qualitative, or mixed methods uh, data and done an analysis of that data and presenting that those findings. Letters to the editor look at writing comments to the editor based on um, uh, other articles within that journal that you've read or um, a, uh, an issue that is relevant to that journal that you want to bring up. And the editor has the, um, the, the final say in whether they publish that letter. It doesn't go through peer review. And then edi editorials and guest editorials. So from time to time, mostly editors write their editorials, but from time to time, they'll ask guest editors to write them as well. And usually they're on some timely topic um, to discuss what's happening um, in, in current research or practice. Uh, just to highlight the, 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 the glossary and terminology. So we're in the process of creating a shared list of terms to which people can contribute to. Um, I think Lynn's gonna provide a, um, a link to that or there will be a link provided for you so that you can share and contribute to that. This glossary will help to communicate across areas of interest and it will help su support learning of research, writing, and publish publishing processes. So we all have, using similar terminology, we all understand things in similar ways. So I'm going to spend most of the rest uh, of my time on uh, choosing a journal for publishing your work. Um, so I'm going to go through four areas, uh, four, four key points in consideration for choosing a journal. And choosing a journal, oftentimes people don't really think about it in a, in an import, as an important part, point of your dissemination work, but it is, it is a really important point. Um, if you don't uh, choose the correct journal and, or choose a journal that is relevant to you, then you, oops, then you um, may have, may have, um, may face a lot of rejection because the journal might not be relevant. For instance, I can give you an example with occupational therapy, with the journal I worked at, we got a lot of articles that came through that were about occupational health and safety, which is a little bit different um, than occupational therapy. And so we couldn't accept those or put them through. So really you need to understand how, what are the parameters for choosing a journal for publishing your work? So there's four points, deciding on the topic of your work, identifying your audience, creating a list of potential journals and ranking those potential journals. So describing the topic of your work. 
So for the first question to ask yourself is what findings do you want to present in your article? So what, what are you interested in presenting? So oftentimes in our research, we might have more data or more information than we are able to put into one manuscript. Oftentimes, a lot of journals have very limited word capacity, some only 3,500 words, some 5,000 words, some might have more. Um, if they're online journals, oftentimes they'll give you more space, but you might be limited in that way. So you really want to figure out what findings do you want to present in that article. Um, you don't always have to present all the findings in your study, and you can divide those study the, the findings up into really um, pointed and directed um, discussions. The second question is who or what is the focus of those findings? So what, what, is it, what are those findings about? What are they speaking about? Um, what, what, is it, what points do you want to bring forward within those, from those findings? And the last question is what do you want people to know about your findings? So what is, what is the specific interest of those findings? What do you want to tell people about your findings? And all of those answers will help you help direct you. For instance, if, if, it's, if it's about disability inclusive development, then, then you want to find a journal that's about that. But if it's about women and work, then going to a journal on disability inclusive development is not gonna be useful for you. Um, the second point is identifying your audience. So who should know about your findings? So the audience will help you understand again what journal, what, what type of journal might be beneficial because journals typically are either associated with a certain discipline, a certain society or association, or a certain, a certain profession or content area. Um, so you want to figure out who, who uh, it should, would be interested in knowing about your findings, who would be interested in the topic of your article, and who might apply your findings in their work. Because you, in or really when you publish work, you want it also to be used. You want people to be reading it and critiquing it and pulling it into their work. So you want to try to publish in a place where you think people will find your work. Creating a list of potential journals is the third point. So you really want to generate a list of potential journals, not just find one, but generate a list of potential journals. So what might they, and consider the discipline, the population, the key concepts, the research methodologies. And then we're looking at ranking potential journals. And there's five different points. And I'm just gonna go through them briefly. I'm gonna take a couple of extra minutes because we started a little bit late, but there's five points. The mission, vision, mandate, and scope are really important for you to know. So what is the journal about? What are they going to, what are they, what's their vision for the future around knowledge production? What types of articles will they cover? What subject matter will they cover? You need to do a little bit of homework on what the journal's uh, background is and where they're from, because that'll tell you a lot about what, whether your content will fit. You might be interested in looking at the bibliometrics, which means if there's statistical analysis around the use um, of, of research that's been published in certain journals. One of those calculations is called the impact factor. There's a lot of critique around different using different bibliometrics, but bibliometrics do have do demonstrate some indication of uptake of the publications in that journal. Indexing and uh, abstracting are really important. Um, Indexing means what databases are, is that journal indexed in so that people can find and search that journal. Um, there's a lot of different databases and different ones allow for free access, others are paid access. So you need to really think about where your the journal's being um, indexed. Journal acceptance rate. It means the ratio of the number of the articles submitted to the number of the articles published. So how it really indicates how selective or, or potentially prestigious that journal is. However, that's not really the whole story often. It might be that a journal gets a lot of submissions, but only actually has space for eight papers a year or something. So therefore they have to actually have a lower acceptance rate. The journal acceptance rate has nothing to do with the article acceptance. Those are two completely different things. Copyright and use, and then um, Dr. Katarkan is gonna talk about access, I believe a little bit later. So copyright and use. Um, what that means is, is understanding the exclusive legal right of the creator of a work to print, publish, 
and et cetera, so film, doing media presentations, and to authorize others to do the same. So having copyright means you have ownership of that work and that you can use that work. So there's different types of versions. And when you look at journals, they'll have different um, options for different journals. Often submitted versions can be published on websites or repositories, accepted versions, it might also be able to be and need to be referenced though to the final publication, but published articles, unless they're from an open access journal, um, if they're in PDF form from the publisher cannot be um, uploaded to any repositories because the journal owns uh, the copyright of that. So these are the, the, just a summary of those key points that I briefly went through. So the topic of your work, the desired audience, the ranking of the potential journals, and all of these points that really speak to those potential journals. What you want to do is, is rank them. So which ones are the most important for you? You see them the most beneficial, which, which ones might be the most accessible, which ones might be have the best acceptance rate. Um, rank them and then choose, enter that, that list at the, the hardest one to get into if you want, if you're willing to take that risk of, of rejection, but you might get some um, good reviews back from it, or, or one that you think might have um, more, um, more possibility for your paper to be accepted. But there's benefits, pros and cons to being able to, um, uh, to, to uh, choose different journals at different levels. And then just this just really brief, uh, finding and using author guidelines. So looking at the journal website, um, you always wanna go in the journal website, find the guidelines. All journals should have some author guidelines. If not, email the editor. Do, do not be concerned about emailing the editor. That's what they're there for. Look at the tabs. So look at the journal aim, how to submit a manuscript, author guidelines. And then when you're using the guidelines, make sure you read them really thoroughly, highlight key pieces if you have to, make sure you follow them or they'll be rejected or returned to you. Key points in that are authorship, make sure that it's complete and that you have all the authors listed and the, the contributions that they've had. Formatting, make sure you format the paper um, correctly following the guidelines. Make sure that you've met all ethical requirements. If you need to have ethics from a, um, a research board um, or if you need um, a, to demonstrate consent from people, you need to provide that information. Look at report, reporting requirements. Um, so uh, Ecuador is a website that provides um, good guidelines for different reporting requirements and then referencing styles. So the whole bunch of different referencing styles and different journals use different referencing styles. So that is the end of my presentation. Thank you very much, Jane for your presentation. It was very enriching and uh, we thank you very much. And um, I'll remind participants that we keep our questions, we'll ask them at the end, but thank you very much. It was very enriching and we, we have learned a lot and we continue to learn from uh, the presentations that are coming up. Hi, Dr. Pramita, uh, this is Lynn. If that's okay no. with you, um, I do have the rooms ready to go. Is that okay? It's okay, Lynn. Okay, thank, thank you. Thank you. It's okay. I would suggest that we go to our breakout rooms now and talk about the suggestions that Jane has made, the information that Jane has made um, for maybe about 15, 20 minutes, um, and then take a, a 10 minute break and start again at the top of the hour. So, um, so what you will see is uh, an invitation to join a breakout room please click on the link. Um, Jane will be facilitating one group and Ruhina is facilitating the other group. Um, feel free to talk about any of the terms, concepts, um, issues that Jane has uh, talked about in her presentation. And I can start with uh, our group unless somebody else wants to speak. Um, one of the main points that we discussed was, um, you know, the, the writing publishing sort of process. Um, so when do, you, when do you make decisions about what journal you're going to work towards? Um, so 
is that is that something that you decide right right at the beginning or is that something that you decide once you have the paper um you know drafted out put together written up um and disseminated disseminated your ideas into that paper um and our discussions revolved around how when you go to the author guidelines those author guidelines can be kind of restricting in some ways and if you start trying to but like anything if you start trying to you know put pieces of your ideas within somebody else's structure you can lose your own storyline and so what we just talked about and um what everybody sort of came to agree on in many ways was that it's really important that you write your your paper first and put your ideas in it and and then look for a journal that really supports those ideas. And so once you have that, you know, you know what the topic is, you know who your audience is going to be, you know all of those types of, of ideas, you have that understanding, then, um, and you put that journal, like that article together, then who, what journal um, can, might be one that's beneficial for you to submit to. So we were talking a little bit about how author look guidelines can be a little restrictive to ideas, and journals can sometimes themselves be um, uh, a journey, things that sort of limit your perspective as well. And, and with respects to submitting to journals, we spoke about how important actually getting feedback and reviewer input is and how some journals, especially predatory journals and um, some that might be quite, uh, that are trying to get you your money from you might be more likely to um, uh, not provide as much feedback and accept your paper as is. So those were the sort of the main two points we discussed. Thank you. Uh, Hi, everyone. Go ahead, Nenio. Okay. So in our group, we, we discussed about terminologies to writing, and uh, we talked about some some terminologies which we did not understand during the presentation. And we also talked about some new ones which we got to understand better in our discussion. So uh, one of the terminologies which we had uh, difficulties understanding during the presentation was bibliometrics. And uh, so we also went ahead. There was another one indexing, but we got this clarified. So we understood that indexing is like when you submit your keywords to an abstract and they, 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 they group it. The group it uh, just like what they do on Twitter or on Instagram, just like hashtags. So when you put that uh, up, they're going to show you. Uh, uh, it's going to show the definition. So other other papers that have those keywords uh, in it or that are talking about such keywords, and if you put in the wrong words, he may not pick it up. So we also learned about some key terminologies like mesh headings. So uh, we understood that mesh headings are keywords that databases uh, develop. For example, if we see a database like Medline, they make their own uh, mesh headings uh, so that you can search. You, you Maybe you're looking for a word or you're looking for resources with such words, you can easily just go to the mesh headings. Um, for example, also, uh, they may have words that you you have them spell correct uh, differently and they have spelled them in the databases differently. So you want to, you may want to match the words so that you get the right results you're looking for. For example, we discussed the example of aging. It might have been spelled with A-G-I-N-G and you are spelling yours in your write-up as A-G-E-I-N-G. So you want to just match the words and search uh, aging and aging are spelled by you and are spelled by the database so that you pick up pick up every every other resource that is published in that in that database. Thank you. Does any other person have something to add for my group? I think that was a, a great summary. Thank you, Nainu. Thank you too. Okay, thank, I want to thank the two groups for their contributions. And um, since there are no other comments, I think, I think we'll go to the next presentation. We'll uh, probably call on Dr. Takan, who will uh, in 15 minutes do a presentation on writing an academic paper. I think that was a presentation we were supposed to present. Okay, all right. We are, we are looking at uh, 
generally understanding academic writing. We can move to the next slide. Uh, we'll be looking at writing an academic paper, but specifically on uh, authorship uh, issues. So um, there is this uh, group called the Vancouver Group, the International Committee for Medical Journal Editors. They came out with some criteria for authorship that if you are an author to a publication, a scientific peer review publication, you must meet these four criteria, which are that you must have contributed substantially to the conception and design, uh, acquisition of data, or the analysis and interpretation of the data. That's the first criteria, criterion, which is scholarship. Then the second one, which is authorship, it means that you must have contributed to the drafting of the article and revising it for intellectual content. Then the third one, which is approval, all the authors to a paper must approve to the final version of the paper to be submitted to the appropriate journal. Then you might have completed the three criteria for authorship, but if you don't accept or agree to be an author of that paper, your name shouldn't be included. So the fourth one is agreement to be named as an author, which means you will take responsibility for all the aspects of the paper or the section you contributed to intellectually. You can move the slide, please. Now, we have seen the four criteria for authorship. Now, let's look at what constitutes authorship misconduct. Many um, researchers and institutions are indicted in this area. So we'll be looking at some authorship misconducts. The first one is gift authorship. For instance, if you find yourself in an institution where uh, you are under a head of department and you feel that uh, you might want to include his name in a paper that he didn't contribute to it intellectually or that he didn't meet the four criteria for authorship because you need favors from it. That's what we call gift authorship. And it's an authorship misconduct that should not be encouraged in the academia. But we find many of researchers, lecturers, uh, uh, faculty doing this and we must frown at it. It is not a good practice. It's very, very unethical. The second one is uh, ghost authorship, where you find those who actually contributed intellectually to the paper are not listed as authors. It means you find academics who go and hire people, they contract people to do this thing for them, to write papers for them, and they pay them. That is very, very unethical and we have to frown at that. Then we have fabrication of data. There are some people, they sit in their rooms and I will use the word they cook data without conducting any research. That is very, very unethical. We must frown at that. And you find that also in academics, they are doing it a lot. Then you find falsification of data. This could be, you could go to the field, you conduct the research actually, then you come and sit down and start changing figures, maybe to suit what you want. That's very, very unethical. And we call that falsification of data and it shouldn't be encouraged. Then all of us know about, about uh, plagiarism, including self-plagiarism, where you use uh, the words of other authors without actually acknowledging them by citations. So that one too should be discouraged in academia. Then there's also simultaneous submission where you submit a manuscript to more than one journal at the same time. 
uh, is unethical and it constitutes uh, authorship misconduct and should be, should be discouraged. There's what we call fragmentary uh, publications, salami slides, in the sense that you might conduct a research. Let me give you an example of a title, maybe a research on um, knowledge, attitude and, perception, attitude and perceptions of practices. Then you come down, you use each of those variables, let's say knowledge, you come out with one paper, attitude, you come out with another paper, practice, you come out with another paper, just to increase your number of publications and citations. But that one too is, is unethical. It's not, it's not a good practice. So we should uh, frown at it. Then in the case of student authorship, what I mean is that you have supervisors who supervise students' project or dissertation. And at the end of the day, because of the pressure to publish, they will write one or two papers out of that dissertation and put their names as the first author instead of the student's name. That one is unethical and uh, we should also frown at it. Now, the last point here, acquisition of funding doesn't guarantee authorship. We should take note of this. If you acquire funds for a particular research and you don't meet the four criteria for authorship, you shouldn't be listed as an author. Supervision of research alone also doesn't guarantee authorship. If you don't fulfill the four criteria for authorship, you are not supposed to be listed as an author in a scientific publication. Let's go to the next one. Now we're talking about open access. Uh, if you look at it now, many journals are going this way. We encourage open access publishing because like for us in Sub-Saharan Africa, consumers of research, they don't actually have money to, to assess close access journals. With these open access journals, what happens is that once your paper is accepted for publication after going through the peer review process, um, the journal will require you to pay an APC, that's article processing fee, uh, that will cover for the publication. Now, consumers of research like students and other people can assess that article free of charge. And that's the way to go. And you see many journals are going that way now. But for close access, uh, after the peer review, sometimes they will, more often than not, they will, they will publish it for free. But consumers of research, like in Sub-Saharan Africa, who more often than not cannot afford to pay for those articles to assess them, it becomes a challenge. So with this close access, the consumers will pay something. At best, you can assess the, the abstracts of those articles, but the full article you can't. They'll ask you to register and pay something. So we try to discourage that in, in Africa so as to encourage a, a scholarship. So there's this uh, Sheparomio guidelines that uh, accept preprints, postprints, and uh, type certain manuscripts for publications, and you can assess it uh, free of charge. Those, I mean, the consumers of research. Let, let's move to the next. Uh, the next slide. I've given you some links to the Shevarumu guidelines. Then let's go to the next one, please. Now there are some scenarios for discussion. I've given you the four criteria for authorship. I would have preferred we discuss this one in the breakaway sessions, but let's uh, let's look at the scenario, the first scenario: PhD supervisor. You are a supervisor to a PhD student who just graduated. The student is not interested in publishing. You are under a lot of pressure to publish as you are due for promotion. You decide to go ahead with the publication anyway without maybe the student consent. Please, you have to comment on this. Maybe 
the breakout sessions, we'll, we'll look at this. The second scenario, you are a graduate student with a main and a co-supervisor. The co-supervisor suggests writing a manuscript uh, from your paper wholly based on the dissertation. Please take note of this. Writing a paper based on your dissertation. You and the co-supervisor prepare the manuscript and the main supervisor is too busy to provide inputs, but gives the go ahead for submission of the manuscript. Manuscript is a summary of the dissertation. Take note of that. Now, this is the issue. What is your opinion on the inclusion of the main supervisor as an author? And you give your reasons. Let's go to the next one. Other people's contribution. Uh, you have been working as a team in developing a research proposal. I'm talking about the proposal now not the article itself. The proposal is not funded and you decide to abandon the idea. This professor now, one of the team members decided to write a paper which is partly based on that original proposal that you took part in developing. She writes, she invites the other members to participate in the paper write-up and they do not respond. Now, this is my question. How should the professor proceed? We can discuss this in the breakout sessions. Let's go to that. So basically, that's uh, my short presentation uh, on uh, understanding the authorship guidelines and the criteria for authorship in a peer review research article. Thank you. If you have any questions, then we'll go ahead and take them. Dr. Taka, thank you very much for your, for your presentation. I think you have raised a number of pertinent issues that we, when we go to our breakup rooms, the, it, will be, it will be heated because you raised a number of issues that I have in mind that I've experienced also, and it is going to be, it's going to be interesting. So thank you very much for your presentation. We did enjoy your presentation. Thank you, thank you, thank you. All right, I'm going to open the rooms. Um, you have the, th the general idea of the three scenarios. I think in your breakout room, you can discuss uh, which scenario you want to start with or which variation of the scenario you want to start with. Um, should we say 20 minutes and then we come back to the large group? Would that be okay? Okay. okay, so let's say about 15, 20 minutes. I will put the scenarios um, in, the, in the chat for the, try and put them in the, in the uh, chat for the breakout rooms. Scenario um, and talking about thinking, so that was the one where a proposal didn't get accepted and uh, one of the authors wanted to continue with publishing and came to the conclusion that the original developers would be acknowledged uh, for their contributions but not included in authorship but it got it got us into a very complex uh, conversation around uh, plagiarism and contra intellectual contributions um, but also thinking about the due diligence of the author that ended up that, that wanted to publish that paper and the actions that they were taking to make sure that they received consent and reached out to the contributing authors um, to the proposal. So uh, we had many conversations of different ways of approaching that. And then we also talked about the first scenario and I don't, we, the scenario was um, about a PhD supervisor publishing the work of their student that didn't want to publish necessarily um, for promotion. And we didn't come to a final uh, decision between us, but we did talk about um, the, the making sure that the student got the uh, acknowledged and um, it was their contributions were uh, recognized and not that the um, supervisor would take 
ownership or uh, take credit for the work that was done in the PhD. And so we were still in the middle of that discussion and, and got pulled back, but there were some great ideas around um, what that would look like in consent, what that would look like, uh, consent to publish if the student didn't want to be involved, but also what that would look like in terms of authorship order and, and listing authors. Anything that I missed, Mamadou and Nenyu? I think you did a great summary. I just want to add that in the third scenario, we also discussed that uh, uh, the professor could give, or the person who had picked up the write-up can just acknowledge the original uh, person who started the idea uh, in the manuscript, but should not credit them authorship because they did not actually contribute to the writing of the manuscript. I also got into that interesting part where if you finally publish and they come maybe angry that you had stolen their idea or something, you can bring up the email you had sent to them that you tried reaching out to them, but they did not uh, respond. So that can save you. And uh, in the other scenario, the first one, uh, we were uh, contemplating whether because we had uh, seen that it's necessary to credit the student uh, authorship because they are the original developers of the manuscript. We think that the professor might have just done some tweaking or adjusted the manuscript to fit the journal. Uh, uh, so they should be credited authorship. But then we were still discussing whether we should give them the first, uh, we should credit them as the first author or the last author. So we're between that discussion. Thank you. Can I ask a question? Sure. sure. <laughs> I'm, I'm curious to know if anyone uh, has guidelines of what due diligence would be in the situation where you're trying to reach potential co-authors and you can't get to them. So, you know, you, you send an email how much are you supposed to do that would actually be due diligence? Does anyone have an answer for that? We did discuss a, a sort of a similar sort of scenario about that. Um, not necessarily sort of the definition of due diligence to the extent, but but um, the 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 requirement to actually. Um, uh, document all that you've done in order to contact the people that the relevant uh, authors or potential authors. Um, and so one of the things, you know, if you send out an email, let's say, and you don't hear back from people, did they hear from you? Did they actually hear from you? Did you have the right email address? All of this. So if you don't hear back, then, you know, verifying the email address, demonstrate you do that. Um, demonstrate like if you can't don't have an email you have a phone can't try to contact them in other means and document that um, I always whenever I've done like let's say I've done a phone call and I've talked to the person I would get their email or some of their correspondence so that I can have something in text and I would write it and send it as we've discussed in the you know in the phone call this is what you've decided please confirm um, in an email you send out, you should always put like a due date so that you have that. So please contact by this date if you want to be included in this. And so you give sort of a, a deadline. If if we don't hear from you, we will assume that you don't want to contribute. So provide all of the information there so that people understand the the, the what they have to do in order to um, respond or not respond to you and then keep that uh, trail. So that would be that was sort of what we discussed more about how to document because the difficulty is if you don't hear from people you can't put them as author and you can't acknowledge them so you have to get approval about acknowledgements and you have to get approval about authorship but nowadays any online journals for sure require you to put all the contact information in for each of the authors the co-authors so all of that needs to be done um, and partly you know a lot of what needs to be done needs to be done before you even start doing work with these people. Um, and that's one of the, um, even, and if you have a student and you're doing PhD, like you have them sign, you know, an oath of confidentiality, you have them providing a permanent address, you have them, you know, stating what they agree to do, what they don't. So documenting things even beforehand with respect to that might be an important thing to do. I don't know if there's anything that Dr. Tarkin or, or Dr. Kamita want to add. 
No, I don't think so. I think uh, you exhausted all the points we gave. So I, I'm, I'm okay. Did you want me to continue? We can just talk about what um, our group did. I don't know if Ruhina's group was finished or if Dr. Kamita wants to talk or, or Dr. Tarkan wants to talk about what we discussed in our group. No, I think, I think, I think Jen, you should go ahead. You discuss what we, what we talk in our group. Okay. Sorry, I'm going to jump in, Jane. Yeah. As, as timekeeper, yeah. um, we're, it's, we're due for another break. Okay. So rather than starting into hearing from your group, I'm going to suggest that we take a break uh, and come back at the top of the hour. Uh, we can have an informal discussion in the meeting, um, but let's continue hearing from your group at the top of the hour. Okay. Certainly. Certainly. Sounds good. Thank you. Okay. All right. Yeah, I want to welcome everybody back to this particular session. So without wasting any time, I think I'll give the floor to Jane, probably to make a presentation on what uh, her group discussed based on what uh, Dr. Takam presented. Jane, you have the floor. Thank you, Dr. Kamita. Um, so we had discussed about the, um, the first one quite a bit, I think, with respects to uh, the, the first scenario, which was the supervisor and the student who didn't want to publish. One of the other points to that though, that I will add is um, we spoke about how if the student, if it's, a, if it's a thesis of the student, then if the student will have done a considerable amount of work in creating that. So if we look at the level of intellectual contribution, then a lot of the, the group that we were talking, like the group of us, uh, came to more or less a consensus that we felt the student should remain first author. It would be very unlikely the student shouldn't be first author because it is the student's work. Um, and most, pretty much in most thesis, the students would have to have written up a, a pretty tangible part of that. So uh, there would only be uh, a few positions where this, the, the student's work might not have been as strong as could be, but the student has to pass. So the student's work has to be at some level. Um, we also just spoke briefly also about some pro, mo, many programs now require students to publish either concurrently or, or within a pretty close time period to their um, defense. There are many programs where the student has to have published at least two or three manuscripts from their work before they can actually defend. And so that takes care of this whole issue um, in relation to that. Um, with the, the second scenario, I'm trying to remember which one it is. Um, second scenario, uh, the co-supervisor. Co right, the supervisor. So the supervisor, um, we, we spoke about how, um, trying to really think about the, whether the supervisor would have provided any contribution at all. And when it came down to when we think about the scholarship, did the supervisor provide any type of level of contribution um, when the co-supervisor really took on most of that role of really supervising the student? And um, we, we discussed, you know, one of the parameters that Elvis brought up is many journals require now that you specify the specific contribution of each one of the authors. And so what would you say about the supervisor? And I think that's what is a really good sort of um, point with respects to making that decision. So if you can say that the supervisor can, uh, you know, provide a, a considerable contribution to the conceptualization of the work or supported understanding of the methodology, data collection, like something like that, that, that you feel would, would be substantive intellectual contribution to that work, then they would, would meet that criteria of scholarship and then it would just become come down to approval. Um, so we, we spoke a lot of sort of about that piece, but then trying to think about, you know, trying to actually also give the co-supervisor the acknowledgement of, of the considerable amount of work that they've done. And, you know, also reflecting on the whole research process, if, if you have a supervisor, you know, the power dynamics here, if you have somebody who's a supervisor who isn't providing as much and the co-supervisor is, then there should be some um, point of communication where you know, th that, that power dynamic has to shift a little bit and perhaps the co-supervisor needs to be acknowledged better. Um, and then the last point was about the uh, publication of the, the um, if the people don't respond to the, the um, 
they email out by one of the co-investigators on a grant that was unfunded and they want to re they want to work on the proposal um, for me it's a simple sort of documented reaching out to people uh, case scenario um, just because you were part of a proposal doesn't mean you would be part of a manuscript it's it's you know it's the same as if you're part of any funding project or if you're part of a larger group it doesn't necessarily indicate that you will be one of the um, people on that um, typically those proposals those larger conceptualizations get quite quite modified quite a bit before publication I don't see a huge um, plagiarism uh, issue there, but you might want to look at acknowledging people, or you might want to, in acknowledgement, say that this work stemmed from a, the work done by a research team or a group. You can only name people if they're allowed if they allow you to acknowledge them. Um, I would keep all of that documentation so that I can actually show the editors that you know I did try to reach out. If anything comes back, because um, it's it's always whether you know somebody challenges that publication uh, most of the time after the fact after when it's printed so those were the conversations that we had and we i think could have gone on for a few hours thank you jane <laughs> dr taka anything she missed out no 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 no. i think she, she's in order okay thank you very much i don't know oh, was, yeah. was there another group i don't know was there another group no there's just the two groups I think okay, one thank you, Lynn. Things, oh, go ahead, Lynn. I was just going to say, I think one of the things that Jane mentioned that sometimes uh, we forget is uh, people who are acknowledged even on a paper need to give their permission for their name to be listed in the acknowledgements. Uh, we're familiar with the fact that people need to agree to be an author, co author. Um, but sometimes we forget that the, uh, the people that we want to acknowledge also need to agree. And I've been in situations where we wanted to acknowledge someone, but we couldn't contact them. We could not uh, get a response from them. And as a result, we did not feel comfortable putting their name on the paper, even though we wanted to acknowledge their contribution. I don't know if anyone has any other thoughts about that. Um, there are you, you depending on the situation, um, you know, and it's the same with organizations. If organizations don't want you to list them, then you can't list them. But you can sort of do a bit more of a blanket statement if you want that there. So if they contributed to um, some ideas in it or something, you can you could say like the the other the other contributors who who offered feedback over the process of the paper or something, so that. You know, they're they're not named in there, but people understand that there were other people who provided some uh, contribution, but didn't didn't um, didn't meet the criteria with respect to authorship. Thank you. Any other comment? Okay, thank. I want to thank the two groups for their comments and analysis. I think. Uh, the debate will go on and I think we we are learning a lot from what is going on. So like I said, we we are really, we have to be strict on time. So I will pass over the floor now to Dr. Takan to do his second presentation. And when when he's done, I think uh, you take you, you, you take down your questions and then we'll go straight to Jane to make her, her own presentation and then the discussion goes from there. Thank you very much. Dr. Takan, you have the floor. Thank you so much, thank you so much. Uh, we'll be talking about planning out your paper as, as a team. Uh, move to the next slide, please. So in the previous uh, presentation, we looked at the criteria for authorship in terms of scholarship, in terms of authorship, in terms of approval and uh, agreement. And I said, in most journals now, they require you to state the contribution of each author which means in a paper, you assign rules, you discuss as a team, all the authors, you assign rules to yourselves. Let's move to the next one. And now I want us to look at the structure of a peer review research article. We have the title and the abstract. We have the introduction, the methods, 
the results, and then we have the discussion. So we have to assign rules. We discuss as a team that, okay, you take the introduction, you take the methods, and you assign people to the other sections. But this is where I have a great problem with uh, our own area, the public health. You realize that in a paper, you find more than 20, 30 authors. So I used to ask myself, what are all these number of people doing on one, one paper? What were their roles? How many people wrote the introduction? How many people wrote the methods? How many wrote the result and, and the discussion? So we have to make sure that if they don't fulfill the criteria for authorship, they shouldn't be listed as authors. So let's, let's move to the next one. Now, you have to keep the standards by adhering to these authorship guidelines. I've given you the, the links there that you can go to the Vancouver group and see the, the guidelines. Let's move to the next one. Now, once you have written your paper following this structure, even if you don't see the structure in a particular paper, they are implied in those papers. So now, you, you look out for your journal, a peer review journal, like uh, Jane, I heard Jane saying, we have a lot of pretty journals now, they don't consider a robust peer review process. So what is the importance of peer review? And what is peer review in the first place? It's just a critical assessment of a manuscript submitted for uh, publication by experts who are not members of the editorial staff, which means once you submit your paper, it has to go through this, this process. And it is the, the chief editor, that is a link between you and these uh, reviewers. And the focus of the chief editor or the peer reviewers is not to reject your paper, but it is to refine it following some guidelines and checklist. They act as a quality control system mechanism put in place by journals to make sure you publish good science. So they check out of plagiarism and other ethical practices. So let's move to the next one. Now you have to resist gift authorship and ghost authorship. We have already discussed that one. Now, once you have your paper in this format of the title, abstract, introduction, method, result, discussion, now you want to look out for a publication, to, for a journal that can publish your, your paper. Now, what you consider is this. What journals would your audience be interested in? And which journal will be interested in your story? That's your paper. Once you have a journal, you go, you study the website, the aims and scope of a journal, the instruction to authors. Now you have, you have your paper in a draft manner. You follow the instruction to authors of the paper. You follow, I mean, of the journal, you follow their guidelines. You reformat your paper now based on that guideline. For instance, now, if your references were in a, the APA format or style, and the journal says, we want but the Vancouver, you have to change it to the Vancouver. That's a submission process. Then normally most journals now, they have an online submission process where you have to register and then you log in, you submit. Once you submit now, let's move to the next one. Once you submit, the chief editor will acknowledge that they have received your paper by an email. But please, that acknowledgement is not acceptance. It has to go through the process now. They'll look at it, they'll check for originality. If it is not original, is it innovative? The chief of plagiarism and other things. Then if it passes through now, they will send it, the chief editor will send your paper to reviewers. And 
they will submit a checklist to the reviewers what they have to look out for. Now, your paper can be rejected at the editorial level. And once it is rejected, it will not be sent for peer review. But once it is sent for peer review, they will give them a, the, peer, the peer reviewers a checklist. And then there's a time frame that maybe within two weeks or one month, please submit your uh, review comments. Now, once the review comments are submitted, you might have one of three outcomes. They might say, okay, accept the paper as it is, uh, accept provisionally with minor or major revision, or they'll reject outrightly. Now, once they say, okay, revision, you revise following their comments, or you can report that, okay, no, I think it should stay like this. Now the entire process is once the paper is finally accepted, it goes through the production process. Now, if it is a journal that requires that you pay an APC, it is at this level after acceptance that those requests for the APC, they will request before. Once you see a journal that requests for an APC before, please just know that it could be a predatory journal. Now your journal will go through, they will send you a gallery proof, and you go through, make some minor corrections, they'll indicate the type of corrections you can make. At this level, you must take note that to maintain standards, you don't act or remove authors. Once the paper has been accepted, if for instance, one of your co-authors did something wrong to you after the paper has been accepted, don't come down and say, okay, I will show this man out. You remove his name, it's not acceptable. Let's, let's go to the next slide. As I said, the main aim of the review process is not to reject your paper, but it is to refine it. Now, the picture you see here are various reviewers that your paper has been sent to for review. And they have their various equipment that they use to refine your paper so that the paper can be accepted. You can see the various equipment there. They will cut your paper. They will do this to the paper, reshape it so that at the end of the day, you know what you are, you are publishing is of high scientific standard. So that's the aim of uh, uh, peer review. Let's go to the next one. I think that is, uh, yeah. As a beginning researcher, you have some um, websites that can help you grow in your writing of uh, research papers and all that. So go to the next one. You have them, I've listed about two. You have Equator. Go to the next one, please. And the author aid. So I think that's all about this uh, short presentation. Thank you so much for, for listening. Lynn, over. Yeah, uh, Dr. Dr. Takan, thank you very much. Please, Dr. Takan, you probably in uh, probably 30 seconds, can you again introduce yourself to us, please? Okay, yeah, uh, I'm Professor Takan, the head of the Department of Health Promotion, the School of Public Health in the University of Health and Allied Sciences in Ghana here. But I am a Cameroonian. Oh, I'm a Cameroonian from the Southwest region of Cameroon. But I work with the University of Health and Allied Sciences. I've been the head of the department. Thank you very much. Yeah. Thank you very much. We needed that. Thank you very much for your presentation. It's, it's yeah. very, very enriching. And for us in most of the groups that we're writing uh, papers with the Power Project, I think this, uh, these are good comments or good uh, discussions that we will use when we are publishing our paper. Thank you very much. Without wasting any time, I think, Jane, you have the floor. Perfect. Thank you. Um, so I'm just going to briefly touch on translating academic work to popular, popular media. Um, it's, it's, uh, I have written, I have an article or editorial about um, the use of uh, social media, but it isn't one of my fortes, that's for sure. Um, but I just wanted to touch on sort of five different areas. There's a lot of, a lot of different sort of upcoming um, new forms of popular media that can be used. But the objective of, of translating your, your academic work that you might have published into popular media is really to help expand the reach of your work. And that helps with the dissemination to different groups, especially those who might be um, 
who might not have access to a lot of the the databases or others that that um, are are accessible to anybody who works in academics or or in universities or organizations. So I'm going to talk about these five areas specifically. <clears throat> so if we look at expanding your work, popular media um, allows us to do that really well. It allows us to communicate new knowledge to others who don't have access or do not have access to academic uh, sources. Um, it helps move your publication forward. Oh, I ended it with a P there. Forward into, into, into the public realm. And um, it's vital for uptake and practice, for informing future research, and to support applications for uh, research funding. So, I mean, any any type of breadth, and, and if you can disseminate your work further, um, then it's really important. And uh, yesterday, two of my uh, former students, Samira Khan and Zara Kanji, presented their work, and they've had a great success at actually expanding into uh, different sources of pop popular media. Um, and there's different formats evolving as people continue to try them out, you know, especially with online technologies as they are. So conference presentations, they're very important to do. Often we sort of situate ourselves within uh, the conferences that are more, most comfortable for us or ones where our colleagues of, of like-minded disciplines are, are situated. And one of the things that we need to think about in more, in a broader sense, Kind of like what Pearl has done in many ways is to try to bring together different voices, and so um, the it, it's really important for you to think about conferences as as a broad um, opportunities, not just within your discipline. They typically are most closely aligned with academic work, academic presentations. Um, they the requirements of them can depend greatly on the focus of the conference. The, there's opportunities for different types of conferences organized around disciplines, professions, but also communities or specific locations. Um, and you can, any presentations can be brief, like one minute in length. They're, especially with the online, they're doing rapid um, uh, one minute presentations to extended discussions of one to three hours. Oh, I pushed the wrong button. Get myself all in a tizzy when I do this. Okay. Okay. Uh, abstracts. Um, so we are, we're used to abstracts on academic work where they can uh, really sort of outline this or summarize the academic work, but they can also um, allow for dissemination into larger or broader audiences. You can write abstracts that are non discipline specific, so that really focus on um, larger audiences of academic. A diverse groups. So the any sort of disciplinary jargon, those types of things will be limited in those types of abstracts. And then layperson uh, abstracts. So larger audiences with limited knowledge of the discipline. You can you can rewrite your abstracts and post them on your, your websites or post them around for people to access and link them to your publications to allow people to have that link. Um, it allows for a larger dissemination. Um, and also videos, so more so different um, different uh, um, uh, journals are allowing for actual um, web-based summaries of your work, but also social media. There's many video-based social medias where you can present a summary of your work. Because you own the knowledge of that work, then you can translate that work. As long as that, that's, that's what the copyright says, you can translate that work into many different, different ideas and different options. Um, there's association newsletters and magazines, so they're not journals per se. They don't usually go through a peer-reviewed process, but they might go through an editorial review or an editorial process or, or editing. Um, there's, these types of newsletters are associated with different societies, organizations, or groups. Um, they typically disseminate more brief summaries and practice overviews, um, and they don't necessarily focus on research-specific uh, dissemination, more general knowledge. So they're really good for like practice papers, opinion pieces, theoretical pieces, those types of things. And they also will, uh, the audience will be less academic, usually more practice-based, more action-based. The newspapers, so working with editors and writers within newspapers. So I mentioned before opinion pieces, 
within journals. You can also write opinion pieces within newspapers. You might have heard of op-ed, so opinion editorials where people uh, uh, convey their own opinions about certain ideas. Um, we could, you could, uh, uh, opinion papers might construct within newspapers like state of the art practices around something in a layperson language. You can write again letters to the editor in newspapers um, uh, conveying certain ideas and you can do media interviews. And uh, the two students I mentioned yesterday of mine um, were interviewed by the, the senior editor of the University of Toronto newspaper a couple of weeks ago. And so they, they were able to talk about their research within the newspaper, which is going to have a reach of, of tens of thousands of students um, that will be able to access that. The, and then sort of if we just sort of think about in more broad sense, the traditional and new forms of popular, popular media. Um, so popular media is, is diverse forms of media technology. So broadcast, digital, print, any type of, of format that, that produces or conveys certain information or broadcast information to a group. Um, there's, a, there's a different uh, research um, processes, and some of them are being uh, discussed within the, this institute around uh, how to disseminate research diff in different forms. So infographics, which is more pictorial based and conveys a certain story within one image. Uh, theater performance, so how we convey and, and create um, research that, that can be disseminated and understood through a performance um, that's provided uh, one way blog. So there's one way so people blogging and writing um, their own um, journals or ideas. And then there's two way more two way social media. So where people can respond to others comments and build on others comments. And then there's um, many others also within this this institute, as I mentioned about with respects to storytelling and uh, creation of timelines and things like that as well. That is my the end of that. Thank you very much for the for the presentation and everything. Like I said, I'll give five minutes for people to probably ask questions to uh, Dr. Tucker and Dr. Jane for yeah, so that uh, we can go ahead with the evaluation. Please, you have the floor. You just raise your hand and then uh, I'll call on you, or you just go ahead. Okay, thank you very much uh, for giving me the opportunity. I am. The discussions are really, really intriguing. Looking at the research process and publications and so on. In our small group, we, I have had, I have had this kind of intriguing discussions where I had to work a lot with a student, and then the student uh, that, like, I was, I'm supervising a work for another senior colleague. And then at the end of the day, it's the, it's the, call, it's the senior colleague that takes opportunity to, to, for publication. Take, and I am just... Takes credit. Take credit. Thank you very much. Takes credit for the publication. And I am not even mentioned in the work at all at all. So I think these discussions are good and they help to edify some of these kinds of practices. I don't think that it's a good practice. And I was not very, very happy at that time. Uh, there are things that yeah. happen. So can we can we linger on that much. for a minute? Thank you, Luis. Yeah. What do we do in that situation? What are the options for what to do in that situation? You see, he mentioned that in this situation now uh, it, it's, it's, it's a bit uh, complicated. He mentioned that he's a senior colleague, and if he finds himself where. Uh, his action, if he wants to do the right thing or opposes what is happening, it might land him into, into problems because... <laughs> <laughs> that's correct. Yeah, that's <laughs> correct. correct. <laughs> so sometimes yeah. you know, we are in a tight corner and we just, we just let go some of these things. But it's we just swallow it and then we, yeah. we, we hope for a better future. Yeah. Okay, thank you very much. I will, I will call on Leslie as uh, Leslie to probably say something. What uh, from from the two from the two presentations? Leslie, Dr. please. Dr. Kamida, Dr. Kamida, sure. uh, Lynn has her hand up. Okay. Oh, sorry. Lynn, please. 
Okay, my question goes to, to Dr. Takang uh, about looking for a journal to publish your work. So I kind of find it challenging if I finish writing my manuscript or within writing, I'm thinking about uh, a journal. I don't know where to start looking. So at one point I may just have to be asking for recommendations. So I was wondering if you could share possible ways through okay, which we can easily find journals to publish. That's a, very, that's a very good question. The easiest way to look out for a journal to publish your work. You see, you are, you are publishing in a particular area and the references you cite in your work are in a similar area, the area in which you are publishing. So you just look at your reference list where those journals that you cited have been published. Look out for one of them. That's the easiest way to go about it as a beginner. Then you can also ask, if you have mentors, you can ask from your mentors and they can direct you. But the easiest way is to look at all those journals, I mean, the articles that you cited in your paper that you want to publish. And just go there, you will see, because you are producing similar works, that's why you cited them. You will see the journals where they publish their works and you go to the website, look at their scope. That's the easiest way to find out, to look out for a journal to publish. That's, that's what I will tell you for now. Thank you very much, Doc. I have a question for uh, Dr. Kar Tarkin. Um, yeah. When you get a when you receive an article that has you know twenty or forty co-authors on it, um, the what what possibilities do you have as an editor to challenge that, or do you not? No, no, no. You don't have any. You, you can't challenge that. Yeah. So you, can, you can't challenge that as an editor. But what I said is that if you look at it very well. Among those 40 auditors, uh, 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 authors or co-authors, there will be many of them who are just gift authors. For sure. Yeah, so we, that, that's what I'm saying. Yeah. But uh, you, can't, you can't challenge. There's nothing you can do about it. it it's, it's frustrating because, you know, there's nobody there to, to challenge the practice because unless somebody challenges it within that authorship. That's what we find ourselves. It's very difficult to challenge some of those things. Mm. Even if you know that it's unethical. And of course, what are 40 people doing on one, one publication? Yeah, for sure. You know, you get, a, you get a scoping review and they get nine articles and there's 10 people. It's like, you know, how long did that take you? Mm -hmm. Hello? Yes, yes, my question, yes, my question to Dr. Takang is, when he was talking, I heard him talk about title, abstract discussion, but I didn't hear him say anything about literature review. So I was other in what publications or documents do we have to involve literature reviews? No, no, no. The, the, what? Okay, like now, the what we are, what I was discussing is actually for original research articles. There are different forms of publication, like uh, review articles. You have short communications, you have concept papers. Those ones, they, they are different forms, and but they have their, but they don't take this format we're discussing about. Okay, thank they don't you, follow Doc. this format. Okay, I have a second question to Dr. Jane Davis. She talked about occupational therapy. I wish to find out that was the difference between occupational therapies and the uh, Occupational safety and health. Well, um, some people would, some people in the occupational therapy world might say that occupational health and safety could actually be a subcomponent of occupational therapy. But um, occupational health and safety um, can can look at like the health of buildings. So, are buildings um, producing certain gases that create a toxic uh, atmosphere for people? Um, it looks at work pra workplace practices and are those workplace practices, um, and this is where it ties in with the occupational therapy a little bit, workplace practices are, are safe, are there regulations and policies in place, are people following them? Occupational therapy would have, could evaluate that and help, help the organization to promote better workplace safety practices. But typically we work with people who might have had an injury or illness and, and require return to work or require accommodations within that workplace. And so we would work on creating those accommodations. Uh, 
So it comes from a little bit more of a perspective of, of rehabilitation or participation than it does from the environmental impact on the, the person at the broad level. Okay, thank you very much. I wish to thank Dr. Takan and uh, uh, Dr. Jane for the very enriching discussion we have had this afternoon. We we or the, and this morning we are really really grateful and we have learned a lot. We have learned a lot from uh, their discussions, their input, uh, the way forward, the challenges we face as academia in publishing or where to maybe, maybe showcase our results. And I think we are really, really grateful for all the work they have done to make this day a, a big success for us. Thank you very much.